We've reported before on the fight to stop rare and endangered breeds of farm animals from dying out. Whether it's for philosophical or financial and marketing reasons, those involved are members of a small but committed club of gene savers. On the New South Wales north coast, one small farm is home to a range of rare and endangered poultry, as well as one of the most striking of all the British cattle breeds. Dr Lindsay Murray grew up on a soldier settler block near Wakul in South Australia. As a child, he dreamed of being a farmer. There were six children, I was the second son, so the first son got the farm and the other boys had to find something else to do. The rural recession kicked in and there was seen to be no future in farming and uh, we were all encouraged to, to get off the farm and do something else. Lindsay became a doctor specialising in emergency medicine. Six years ago, while holidaying in Mullumbimby, he bought a small block of land. A spur-of-the-moment thing, he thought it would make an ideal retirement property. I wasn't planning to live here, but it soon got in my blood and I soon realised that 16 acres wasn't going to be enough for me. Um, and fortunately, some years later, I was able to negotiate um, uh, buying next door and get serious about fixing up a very old run-down farm and turning it into something. Moving here meant he could finally run cattle. But which breed? So the challenge for me was to be involved in a, in a rare or struggling breed that had some merit and deserved to be preserved. He read about, then saw British Whites and fell in love with the cows with Mickey Mouse ears. They had a wonderful history, they were a long established breed, relatively sort of pure genetically, but seemed to have some good characteristics for where I was wanting to have them. So the colour pattern, the white hair, the black tips, the black underskin is, I think, is good for a tropical climate. And then they were docile and they're uh, naturally polled, so I wasn't going to have to worry about wild cattle or horns or getting gored in the yards. Lindsay started off with seven. He now has more than 70. Come and make pick. Come on! One of Britain's oldest breeds, the British White was a dual purpose animal, raised for its meat and milk. But it fell out of favour with the introduction of specialist dairy cows. And by the 60s, the British Whites had almost died out. While he didn't choose them for decorative reasons, there's no getting around their attractive colouring. Has that one there got the colouring that you yeah, like? Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly the way I want. See bottom jaws, black, ears are nice and black. You can't quite see the hooves, but they're all black. And even the perineum there is black. Um, so, you know, nature's incredible. Every little important area of the body has been covered with good What about this one here? A little bit too white on the ears for me, and oh. white on the bottom jaw, you see? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we'll work on that. There are 15,000 registered British Whites in the UK, but only 500 in Australia. Even my little herd could make a big difference to the future of the breed in Australia and, and around the world. So every, every committed breeder um, at the moment makes a difference. This isn't a purebred herd, some are half crosses. I'll so keep this calf yeah. and join it to a British white bull and then I'll get a third cross yes. which will be A grade. The fourth cross can be registered as a Australian purebred. Pure bread. Yeah, there's another red one that's better marked, yeah. Alba. Just the red muzzle, so, so you want to eventually get rid of that red colour? No, I'm happy to leave it. It's a recessive gene, it'll be there in the background. If I bring in a bull that doesn't carry the gene, all the calves will be black again. Yeah. My last bull carried the gene, so I've got, I have got a few red animals. He has years of work ahead of him, culling, selecting and building up purebred numbers. Do you want your farm to be like a, a, an ark or a museum for this breed or do you want to take it one step further 
and grow the breed and actually get chefs and locals saying, I want to eat your beef? Look, I would love people wanting to eat my beef that is British white and pasture fed. But, you know, in the larger picture, what I would like is to help um, establish this breed as a commercially viable breed. Lindsay and his partner Duncan James have been eating British white beef for six months now. I can tell stuff that's been um, fed lot and you get that really sort of soft mushy texture. I don't, it wasn't what I grew up with and I don't like it. Um, this tastes like good solid real you know, grass fed Aussie beef to me. Lindsay backs the view that to save rare breeds people need to eat them. Mm. What do you think? Delicious. The more demand for the meat, the more animals farmers will breed. Oh, mm. oh. that's fantastic. I can get better than that. Mm. Nice. Mm. And for this breed, it's going to be, although we can milk them, and I have milked and drunk the milk, it's going to be all about eating them. Focused on the breeding up phase, Lindsay's a way off commercialising this operation. But that's the goal. He thinks the timing's right too. And I think we may get the situation where it's like wine, where you want to know who, who made it, which side of the hill it came off, how it was raised, how old it is, what breed it is, and all that sort of thing. So who knows? Those things could only work in favour of a breed like the British Whites, which has such a remarkable history, unusual appearance. Um, and, you know, we're just so lucky still to have them. <laughs> whites aren't the only rare animals on this farm. Also here is a collection of rare and heritage poultry, including ducks, geese, chickens and turkeys. The two rarest are the French wheat and marron and the English silver grey dorking. As well as cattle, Lindsay's always loved poultry. He was so disappointed with his first chooks, he sought out the old-fashioned heritage breeds which he now sells live at the local farmer's market. It wasn't something I'd planned to do, but it was a great opportunity, I suppose, to advance my own agenda, which is I'd really like to see more people in the area have chickens in their backyard, and not just chickens, um, to, to have the, the heritage breed chickens, um, which are really so well adapted for keeping in the backyard or free-ranging on a small block. It's the United Nations of poultry at Dingo Lane Farms, with birds hailing from the UK, the US, the Netherlands and France, which is where his latest acquisition's what from. Have you got there, Lindsay? Well, these are the, the wheat and marron eggs. Um, so they're the brownest eggs that you'll see. They're a French breed. Um, and are they rare? They're very rare. It took me a long time to track down breeding stock. I did eggs sent to me. <laughs> from two different breeders. So I've now got my own breeding pen and I've just hatched my first wheat and marron. So I hope to be able to sell them at the farmer's market this year. Um, they have these beautiful brown eggs. Um, they say these are the only eggs that James Bond would eat. When some of his farmer's market customers were unsure or a bit squeamish about dispatching their own chooks, he started running kill your backyard chook courses. They catch the chicken, kill the chicken, gut the chicken, pluck the chicken, um, get it ready for the freezer and then take it home with them. Yeah, it's not a big deal. Anyone can kill a chicken and get it ready to cook. It's, uh, it's to be a basic human skill. The life Lindsay is creating here is reminiscent of what he grew up with. I hanker after a traditional farm where um, people were largely self-sufficient, they grew their own food, um, they had um, you know, an orchard, a garden, they had crops, they had various types of livestock and they, they produced things for sale but uh, they, much of what was done was just for the farm and for the neighbourhood um, and that, a lot of that uh, has largely died out due to economic pressures, and I understand those, but I think we have lost something, and I think it is nice to look at ways that we can perhaps re regain some of that lifestyle, if nothing else. 
Lindsay's worried, though, by the decline in farming around him. The fertile country behind Byron Bay is now some of the most expensive in the country, attracting not farmers, but the who's who of acting, media, finance and business. It does upset me when I see productive farmland that is being bought to build large houses on and being used as a buffer for privacy and is not being used either as so it's being taken out of productive farm use. I can't blame anyone for wanting to live here. I think, you know, it, it's complex and we need a balance, um, but I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that this is an incredibly productive area, blessed with a wonderful climate, and we should at least be able to feed ourselves. It sort of upsets me that there are um, refrigerated trucks bringing in food for people to eat here from God knows where. Yes. <laughs> Whether it's his rare ducks and geese, the old-fashioned turkeys and heritage chooks, or the British whites, he says it's satisfying growing your own and being part of a wider global preservation effort. But most of all, he's living his dream of running cattle. I love it. <laughs> I do. I love, I love cattle. There's no better feeling than to, um, at the end of the day, to look across the, the paddock or from the hill and see contented cattle um, grazing, feeding their calves, um, coming up to you when they call them. It's just, it's a lovely, lovely feeling. I, lo I love the whole story of the relationship between man and his cattle, yeah, his domestic animals. Mm -hmm.